It says in our gospel story, and the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit and power of the Spirit was upon him. Now Jesus has had the power and the Spirit with him before. At his baptism, the dove came down, right? And then when he was driven into the wilderness, the Spirit attended to him. And now it is the power of the Spirit that comes with him when he comes into his hometown. His hometown where he, the hometown boys made good, gets to read from the scroll. In synagogues, generally there were three readings on the Sabbath, and it was the third reading that was to be the reading from one of the prophets. And so Jesus is handed the scroll of Isaiah. He opens the scroll and chooses to read from Isaiah, the 61st chapter. Now generally, those times when uh, they read from the prophet, people read anywhere from three verses to somewhere in the 20s. They were expected to give enough that told what they were going to then talk about afterwards. Jesus read eh, one and a half. He read, as I read for you earlier, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But there was more that Jesus didn't read. Here's what the second half of verse 2 says. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Jesus didn't choose to read that part. He stopped right at that very pregnant moment. The accept, this is the time, the acceptable year of our Lord. Interesting. When Jesus read from Isaiah, Isaiah was actually telling of a different time, even farther back in history. Isaiah was talking about when Moses came and first was giving the law, and part of the law, the acceptable year of the Lord, was that explanation of jubilee, that time when the community was called from the law of Moses to equalize things, to make things more fair, to change the order of the community so everyone had and none were needy. It actually comes from the book of Leviticus and says here, count off seven Sabbath of years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbath of years amount to a period of 49 years, then have the trumpet sound everywhere on the 10th day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, should the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the 50th year to proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each one of you is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. And it goes on to explain how this jubilee year would make things fair. Debt would be released. Forgiveness would be given to all. Then all would live in the same manner. All would have their fulfillment and what they need. So it started with Moses as he gives the law of God, as a new community is being formed by his leadership, that they were to plan to make a plan for fairness. Not only fairness economically, but fairness socially. And then next it moves on to Isaiah. As the people are returning from exile, Isaiah once again is trying to help them to find that community that God has called them to be. A community of righteousness where all are treated in the same way. A leveling as you may hear that word. And then Jesus, full of the Spirit, stands up to read these exact same words that God has called the community to fairness, to justice, to a way of making the community recognize its interconnectedness, to make the community know that when one suffers, we all suffer a better explanation of that comes from that second reading that Kurt read for us today. 
about the body of Christ and how we are so connected that when one isn't working well, everyone else suffers. There were radical implications for this. And historically, we don't know that the Israelites ever practiced the Jubilee year, that they ever actually did follow this command or law from God. And so suddenly, that whole understanding of leveling, that whole set the captives free, blessed are the poor, becomes like a metaphor or a cry of the prophets for the community to change their ways, to be transformed in order to truly be the followers of God and to know that law and that law that helps them to see how much they need Jesus. You see, truly, what Jesus called for had radical implications to everybody share, to, to forget all of the debts would upset that whole economic system to invite those back into your farm that you'd already sent away for one reason or another to share after 50 years and to set all the prisoners free well just ask california about that right it has radical implications and yet the meaning for this is about God's call for us to know how much we need one another and God's call upon us to follow that way of fairness and justice or righteousness is possibly a better word. Righteousness in the community for us to know how we need one another and how we need to treat one another fairly. Well, this whole theory and this theme of, of goodness to the good news to the poor is not first understood by this story in Luke's gospel. Mary begins this when she proclaims that the wealthy will be brought low and the low will be brought forward. Remember in Mary's song when she sings also a radical song of transformation for the community that God wants this community to know love and grace for all. And I do believe even some of the poorest in our community wouldn't really know how to accept that kind of pure grace and pure love that this calling of God's law expects. And we even ourselves, knowing that we are captive to sin, we are blinded by our own needs and wants, we are poor in so many ways that we need this release as well. So in one way, this is a calling for the community to know that we need to do our part to be different. And in another way, it's a calling for ourselves to recognize our need for that grace and freedom, that release, that good news that Jesus claims. And then there's that. In his hometown, the boy goes forward and says, I have been anointed to bring good news. Jesus aligns himself with Moses and Isaiah. And I don't know if you've read the verses after what we just read today, but it doesn't go so well for Jesus. The hometown crowd gets a little upset. There's no big sign that's before you go into Nazareth that says the hometown of Jesus. Oh no. When Jesus makes this proclamation, they all get so upset that they drag him out to the top of a hill to throw him off. But he walks away through the midst of them. For it's a radical message. But here's the thing, folks. This is God's message. This is what God tells us in the law. And this isn't about finger-pointing to the rich or about calling down some who have maybe become more haughty than others. No, it's not. It's about understanding that we all matter and that others matter to us as well. It's like that Ubuntu theology 
When one hurts, we all hurt. It is understanding that where there is injustice anywhere, we are part of that. Whether we actually were there or not, we are part because we are so connected. We are all one in God's great creation. And the way God wants this creation to be is just, is fair. There's a a great theologian, American theologian named Stanley Hauerwas that suggests the most creative social strategy we have to offer is the church. A social strategy, the greatest one, is the church. Here we show the world a manner of life the world can never achieve through social coercion or governmental action. We serve the world by showing it something that it's, it is not, namely, a place where God is forming a family out of strangers. The gospel begins with the pledge that if we offer ourselves to a truthful story and the community formed by listening to and enacting that story in the church, we will be transformed into people more significant than we could ever have been on our own. As Karl Barth says, the church exists to set up the world a new sign which is radically dissimilar to the world's own manner and which contradicts it in a way which is full of promise. I don't actually believe that we could ever bring about the Jubilee. But I do believe that we can continue to share Jesus' good news, that radical message of righteousness, through the work of the church and through the acceptance of our own need for healing and restoration, that we can be people who share, who reach out and help, and who release those in greatest need. It is the season of promise, and this is the promise of Jesus through our Lord, from God through our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen.